Hi, and welcome to this first lecture looking at an overview of the PHPP version 9.6a. We're going to have a look now at the actual PHPP. This is a blank PHPP in version 9.6a. The first sheet we see, or the first tab, is the instructions tab. There are roughly 32 sheets in the PHPP which can require entry from you, but not necessarily all of them. Some will be more specific to certain projects. For example, Passive House can be used for non-domestic buildings as well as domestic buildings. So there may be some sheets to do with non-domestic buildings that you're not going to need. And there may be a building that you're working on that's very simple in the way it's constructed and serviced. So you may not need to use all sheets necessarily. For the purpose of our course, we're going to be looking at a new build, single family dwelling, detached. So the PHP entry will reflect that and it should be quite straightforward. Just looking at the instruction sheet, which is often overlooked, anywhere you see a yellow cell, which has a comment red corner triangle box here, you should hover over it to get further instructions. So this tells us the PHP will support you with the inputs and make your work easier. The red upper right corner of a cell indicates that you will find useful advice and further information when moving the mouse over the cell. And often the case is that you will actually be provided with default values or input data that you'll need from this cell. So it's very important to hover over it. So looking here now at the different types of cell in PHP, the first standard type is a yellow cell with standard text and font. This is a user input field. So you enter the required value in that field. The second is anywhere you see narrow text with a drop down beside it. The drop down, you can click, for example, this is a link to the glazing in the component sheet. So this will allow you to select values either from pre populated databases in the PHP or from your own manual entries for components like glazing and frames, spacers, this kind of thing. Again, if we hover over this cell, it says in these cells, in addition to selecting from the list, manual entries, only certain permissible content, input of links and formulas are possible. Now in PHP, all the sheets are protected in the PHP. It's very important that you only unprotect a sheet where absolutely necessary. To unprotect a sheet, you can hover over the tab at the bottom and right click and click on unprotect sheet. But only unprotect a sheet if you know what you are doing. Now in this latest version of PHVP, they have, for example, added in numerous extra rows to deal with the fact that a lot of buildings now are heavily glazed compared to perhaps more simple dwellings that would have allowed for up to 40 or 50 windows. Now it's the case that the PHP has been expanded to account for hundreds of windows. So in some cases you will see a plus symbol over here in the left hand column. And indeed you might even see a plus symbol over a column here. Sorry, this would be beside the rows. And so if it's the case that you need to expand the box down to have additional entries, for example, in the window sheet would be the most typical and in the shading sheet, then you may need to unprotect the sheet first in order to allow that to be done. That's a quite simple example. But do be aware that once you unprotect the sheet, there are numerous cells that have background calculation algorithms and equations in them. And if you incorrectly delete one of those, you will be deleting an essential equation from your PHPP potentially. And the result of that cell that you delete the equation from may well be linked through various other sheets on the PHPP. So you could corrupt your entire calculation as well as your actual own PHPP file. So do be very careful. When you do open the PHPP first, the very first thing you should do is immediately save that PHPP file as a relevant file then to the project you're working on and never work inputting data into your blank PHPP because if you input data to your blank PHP and go through a whole project and accidentally save it or have autosave turned on your computer, it could take you quite a long time to delete all the data back to the point of having a blank PHP again. So do be careful with that. We see these gray cells 
aerial blue and bold with gray background. These are also drop downs. And these are a link cell, which you'll only see when you are using the variance macro. The variance macro is not one that we will be using as part of this project, but variance is a new addition to PHP that allows you to look at different potential options. For example, you may have four or five variants of PHP that use different window specifications and glazing or different insulation types, for example. Um, so in that case, you can compare variants side by side for their performance without actually having to just save three, four or five different PHP file names. So it's quite a handy tool to have when you know how to use it. A white cell with black text is simply a calculation field. And you should not change that because these are the ones that typically have the equations in the background. So you should not change those and be very careful if you're ever selecting mass content of user input data from yellow cells in an unprotected sheet, be careful you don't accidentally swipe over a blank cell. And it's also the case in PHP that you could have a completely white cell such as one like this one here. For example, we can see here now when I clicked on this, that up in the formula bar, an actual piece of text appeared. It says meaning of field formats. Now I couldn't see that text there, I just clicked on that randomly to show you the point that even an apparently blank cell in PHP can have text or equations written into it. And if you were, for example, in an unprotected sheet, and luckily here now when I click on this, it tells me to sell your or charge you're trying to change it on a protected sheet, to make a change on protected sheet, and you might re request to enter a password. So if it were the case that the sheet was unprotected and you swiped across that blank because you're just selecting a lot of mass data like these yellow cells and ignoring this white blank one in the middle, you could actually be deleting important information or a reference to a cell in another sheet that has just been hidden by the PHI in writing the spreadsheet. So be very, very careful. It's even the case that when you want to delete information from a yellow cell, rather than even deleting it, I'd often tell people to just enter in a zero value so that you're not actually deleting potentially any background calculation whatsoever. You're just putting in a zero value for something so it won't be, won't be effective in the calculation overall, uh, but you're not at risk of deleting something that you might need. When we see a white cell with violet bold text, that is a reference to another worksheet. So typically when you select that, it will tell you up here, for example, that that is A9, cell A9. So we can see here it's a 78.8. Go to cell A9, A9, and, and there is 78.8 there. So it's just referencing the other cell. So typically you'll see a referenced value when it's being taken from a separate sheet. So if you click on it, the formula will be a bit more complex than this and that it will direct you to the actual sheet. That can be very, very handy as an advanced user in that you want, if you want to interrogate a result and where it's coming from, or if you can see that a parameter is being used as an input to a secondary calculation and you want to try and manipulate the result of that calculation, you will often have to trace back through the roots of the inputs of that. And often the, the way you do that is by selecting the calculation cell and going through the formula that will appear in the formula bar up here. And you might be directed to three, four, five separate sheets with various calculated values. And you'll have to click on those calculated values and look further and further back to what's affecting it. But you shouldn't need to do that on this project, but it's something you can do if you become an advanced user of the PHPP. And then the green cells with black bold font are important results. So they are ones to heed. Scrolling down here now, we can see that this is an inventory of the various worksheets in PHPP. The first five sheets here are basically all just administrative. They give you an overview of your project data. There's a, a fantastic cross-check uh, sheet that will warn you of any errors that you have. And it's very important because you can't issue a PHP for certification unless it is error-free. And this cross-check sheet will show you where you have errors in your calculation or omissions. For example, in previous PHP versions, it was often the case that you would input all the data as far as you were concerned, but for unknown reasons, the primary energy calculation value just would not appear on the verification sheet. And you'd have to go back through all your data to find out where the issue was. And it could often be the case you might have to send it off to somebody else or to PHI for advice. Whereas now with the cross-check, 
it will clearly show you exactly which row and on which sheet the error or omission exists and you can then input the data and it will correct the PHP and, and list it as being error free. So your PHP must be error free. The variance page, as we said earlier on, is for when you want to look at various different specifications, for example, or designs for the building and compare them without having to have separate uh, calculation sheets. What's important is over here, you can see whether certain items are required for the certification or not. So the verification page must be filled in. That's basically inputting data for the building itself and it gives you a summary of results. We'll look at that now in a few minutes. The overview is not a sheet that requires input from you for certification purposes. The cross check does require input in the sense that you must have an error free PHP. So you must look at that continuously to make sure that you haven't got any errors. Variants are an optional use item. And then the comparison between two variants also just give you the results of those. So those are not required. They're optional, but not required for certification purposes because you might just be entering one straight set of certification data for a project and not doing any comparisons. And comparisons are probably often more used in retrofit scenario assessment than in new build where the specification may be clearer. Scrolling down a little bit here, we then have the inputs that are going to affect the heat demand and heat load of the building. This is probably the most important part or section of the PHP. All these tabs here that are in this bright orange are the most important tabs because in Passive House, the key challenge and target is to use a fabric first approach to design a building that has a low annual heat demand or annual heat load, one or the other, but either way, either the amount of energy needed to keep the building at 20 degrees for the year in its location or the size of plant required to do that should be very low. And these are all the tabs that we use to determine that. When it comes to other certain things for certification like primary energy, normally there's no problem there whatsoever. Passive House still has a limit for primary energy of 120 kilowatt hours per square meter per annum. And we'll look at that in more detail later on. So it's a very high value compared to the kind of values we're used to speaking about now in dwellings, especially with NZEB, for example, across Europe and, and the targets we have for NZEB in Ireland. Although just to warn you, you cannot directly compare primary energy values for BEORs with primary energy values from PHEP because they're not based on the same thing. However, 120 kilowatt hours per square meter per annum is still quite high and often easily achievable, especially then with the use of renewable inputs, which PHEP can also account for in many cases. So the climate data sheet, you can either have that generated by the Passos Institute or to have a new tool available to registered users or registered IPHA members or PHAI members or anybody subscribing to PASIPedia.org where you can generate climate data files now uh, specific or exact to one degree of latitude and longitude. So that's a very handy tool uh, to have and we'll be using that for our work. U values must be input so you can see that these are parameters that will affect ultimately the annual heating and heating load of a building. So U values of elemental areas, the actual areas which will affect the size and shape and form of the building, the parameters of the ground, what are the properties of the soil, what's its thermal conductivity, what's its specific heat capacity, are there any, is there use of skirt insulation around the building, for example? Is there groundwater below the building? If so, at what depth and at what velocity will it be flowing? So you do not have to enter in uh, the ground sheet, but it may be applicable, for example, especially if you do have flowing groundwater um, within maybe three meters of your floor slab, for example, that can significantly affect heat loss through the ground. Um, because the ground does, does act as a, a fantastic battery for stabilization of temperatures and providing additional thermal resistance. So it may be required to input um, some parameters in the ground situation. Personally, I always use the ground sheet. And the reason is because you get accurate calculation of what's called the reduction factor for the ground, which basically calculates the U value of your ground floor slab in accordance with ISO 13370 which you've looked at previously. It's not always the case that the, the reduction factor will get that bang on, but it will be very close and will be reflective of the overall average annual performance of the ground under the building. 
Next thing you would look at are the components. So this is where you then enter in data for your windows uh, and for your ventilation system and if applicable maybe your uh, elements of your heating system although they've separated that out a little bit now um, in the latest version to the PHP. The windows tab is very important this is where you'd input the geometry orientation frame lengths and frame widths UG and U values of your frame would be selected although they're entered in the separate in the components tab just before that but selected then from drop down menus for input in that sheet and then Thermobridge heat loss coefficient of the connections and from those inputs the overall U value for the window is determined so that will determine the heat losses through the window and the total radiation is also calculated to calculate your solar gains based on the G value of the glazing and the orientation and area of the window as well as any shading and on that point the shading then is covered in the next tab there is very specific input in PHPP for determining the shading effects on the building and that can be from the building shading itself for example if an L-shaped building does one protrusion of the building influence solar gains on windows on another facade adjacent to it or even indeed the position of the window in the wall will affect solar gain as well as the sun moves around on its, on its daily solar path what is the effect of the depth of the window reveal on when solar gains will start to be realized within the building ventilation then is something that is not fabric specific but is a mechanical system but because passive houses have to have heat recovery ventilation the heat recovery efficiency and the length of ducting from the um, unit to the external wall and any insulation of that that is done will have a significant effect on the overall system efficiency which directly affects then the heat losses from ventilation and infiltration is also input in the ventilation sheet and that's to do with the result of the N50 value from a blower door pressurization test at 50 pascals will be entered on the ventilation sheet and then data to do with the calculation of the ventilation um, system size is in input for example number of occupants and the supply air requirement and then different room types and the extract air requirement and finally there are inputs there for the exposure level of the building and exposure levels have a very significant effect on heat loss in buildings so it's important to try and obtain some level of accurate data to do with the site and its surroundings and its overall location in the building and what exposure level or zone it's at the additional ventilation sheet then is only really used in non-domestic projects or very large domestic projects where you will have multiple ventilation units particularly where you have different ventilation units in that if you have one specific ventilation unit in a building but you have three of them then you can still use the ventilation standard sheet whereas if you have different units of different size and therefore different fan powers and different efficiencies you'll need to use the additional ventilation sheet to input multiple ventilation units and then finally the annual heating tab doesn't require any input it simply lists for you the results of the energy balance calculation the energy balance in PHP importantly is carried out in accordance with EN 13790 so it's not a, a pacifist institute specific developed um, method but actually a European uh, standard method for calculating the heat demand and it's based on transmission and ventilation losses subtracting from that then solar gains internal gains it, it will always be the case typically um, in in regular uh, climates such as ours here in, in temperate or cool climates that solar gains internal gains will be less than transmission and ventilation losses and therefore you'll be left with a net heat demand and net heat load to provide that heat in other climates it might be the case that it's actually warmer outside so you might have a negative heating degree hour figure and you're actually then combating heat ingress into the building uh, so things can go the other way around so for that reason the heat heating and cooling demands and heating and cooling loads are the same target values so it's not a matter of that there's no limit to how much you might need to cool the building They're the same limits exist for heating and for cooling in terms of kilowatt hours and kilowatts of plant size there is a second heating tab which is a space heating calculation by monthly method from EN 13790 as well and that calculation procedure for the monthly method follows that standard and you need to make the appropriate selection in the verification sheet if the calculations will be performed 
using that procedure. And this is typically the procedure you would use for the purpose of certification. So it's a monthly calculation method rather than an annual average calculation method. The results of the two can be very close to each other, depending on the building, or they may um, there may be a discrepancy there of, of a few kilowatt hours per square meter per annum, uh, depending on the building. Then finally, the heating load is used for sizing plant. And again, the, the calculation temperature for internal temperature in passive house is always 20 degrees. And you shouldn't deviate from that without good reason, but we'll look at that in a few minutes on the verification tab. And this sheet basically calculates the heat load of the building under two separate scenarios, which we look at on the climate data sheet in a few minutes and determines what the maximum heat load will be based on climate data for your selected location. Moving on then from the building fabric section, we then have a few tabs that calculate the effect of summer ventilation. So you can, you can use this to calculate how much ventilation is required in summer, uh, be it mechanical or natural, opening of windows, uh, the heat recovery system on in summer bypass. So therefore not actually using heat recovery, but um, with automatically controlled summer bypass or manual bypass, um, or with active cooling, you can calculate as well what the actual cooling load and demand is for the building for sizing cooling plant and then you can determine the effect of that on the overheating risk in the building. So there isn't a lot to input on the, the summer sheets. It's more for calculating the overheating risk, but a lot of the parameters that affect uh, the summer overheating level are in the building fabric section to do with, for example, orientation, extent of glazing, um, G values on the glazing, and other items such as that. Moving down then to what are plant and services sections. The domestic hot water and distribution are very important to calculating how much energy, particularly primary energy basically, will be required to heat the required amount of domestic hot water in the building and the distribution of that system can have a significant effect on that, on that heat uh, because passive house counts basically every single run of pipe from the cylinder to an outlet as an individual pipe um, because it, it basically calculates that once you fill a pipe with hot water that hot water will rapidly um, be transmitted into the dwelling around it if it's running through the heated space or may even be lost to an unheated space adjacent to the building if your hot water cylinder is outside the thermal envelope which can be the case sometimes but obviously for good energy efficient building practice we try to keep all uh, services and heating items inside the thermal envelope but it's not always practical so it will account for losses from pipework so the the way in which pipework is insulated is very important in terms of overall prime energy values for domestic hot water calculation so it's important to fill that sheet in very accurately although it can be difficult at design stage to obtain a set of drawings from a designer that actually clearly shows what the actual pipe work run is going to be because in a lot of houses that will just be decided by the plumber when they arrive on site to install the pipe work as opposed to having a carefully laid out um, domestic hot water pipe run plan which should be the case and it's more the case on larger domestic or non-domestic projects as opposed to single family dwellings it doesn't often happen there might be a rough idea but not an exact idea of it the solar domestic hot water tab can be filled in if solar panels are used they're not a requirement for for passive house typically only used for domestic hot water it's, it's difficult to use solar um, thermal panels for space heating in, in our climate uh, although as the efficiency of panels increases it will become increasingly possible. What's becoming more popular is the use of PV, particularly um, in, in determining part L compliance with building regulations and the use of PV as a renewable to offset primary energy consumption values. And a technology being used quite often now is photovoltaic uh, panels that have a re-diverter once the batteries have been recharged or depending on whether it's got a grid connection to actually heat up an immersion um, cylinder first before it actually diverts power anywhere else. So it's actually a PV supporting domestic hot water. The electricity tab must be filled in, in the for dwellings and there's not a whole lot to input on that tab but it's important that you do it and it's to do with the calculation of electricity demand 
uh, for residential use in this case or non-residential use would be the next one this is separate to auxiliary electricity which is to do auxiliary electricity used for typically plant and services like domestic hot water pumps and fans this kind of thing will be input here the internal heat gains in the IHG sheet you do not have to fill this in you can if you wish but the internal heat gains are calculated automatically in the PHEP depending on the building type and and size of the building but if you wish to input the internal heat gain sheet you can get a bespoke calculation of internal heat gains for the building but it's not necessary for certification the same applies for non-domestic buildings in the primary energy um, sheet which includes primary energy from renewables in the new PHPP this is where you'll select the heating system used in the building as well as the system that's heating domestic hot water they're the two parameters that will affect um, the primary energy consumption in the building will be the uh, electricity used in the building the heating system in the building cooling system as well and the domestic hot water generation system but mainly so it's, it's those heating and hot water systems that will have the biggest effect on the overall result um, in a passive house so you can select the heat generator there and the, C the, the PHP will calculate the primary energy value and the CO2 um, emissions from the building and present them in the verification sheet at the start and to feed into that basically we've got a couple of tabs here that allow you to select what heating system or cooling system you have a compact heat pump these are treated separately to heat pumps in general and then we've got ground source heat pumps and then more standard boilers such as gas oil boiler or uh, wood biomass and this kind of thing and then there's also a district heating input section here which is rarely applicable in Ireland but more applicable in Central European, Central European countries and then finally on the data sheet you can see a lot of the data values that are used in the calculation uh, obviously this this is set by the Passivist Institute so it shouldn't be changed by you um, but at least it's a good source to look at to get an idea of what default values are being used